Okay, so uh, for this class, we're going to kind of move on and uh, start talking a little bit more about um, the functions of the console, but not so much specific to this console, but in general. So we're going we're gonna to cover EQ and just kind of a little bit of mixed development here. And uh, this is one of my favorite classes to do. It's, uh, this is uh, be a really great one no matter what console you're mixing on, even if it's on an analog console. Um, you'll be able to take this back. So, um, so we'll kind of get going here. So, oh, and my information is up on the screen if you want um, a way to get a hold of me and ask me more questions or whatever. Feel free to get at me on Twitter and, and everything like that. Um, my Twitter handle is Yamaha Jake, and uh, you can email me at jcody at yamaha.com, and uh, it'll be great. So if you want that after, you can ask me as well. So uh, this class, we're going to talk a little bit about mixed development and, and kind of really more critical listening, right? So um, we've kind of got our console set up, and uh, we, we've got our inputs labeled, and we know what's going on. And, but um, so now we need to actually start pushing up faders and, and getting things going. And, and um, so we're, a lot of this actually comes with you know, mic technique and mic placement. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about that here just because we're kind of doing more of the console side. But I, I'm still a really big advocate of, of working on that. So we'll touch it a little bit. But um, <clears throat> so when we start approaching our mix and, and when we start mixing, what are we listening for? What are, what are you know, some common things that um, we're really looking for in our mix, right? Um, first, we need to ask ourselves, what's the most important thing in the mix? In contemporary worship, most often it's, uh, it's going to be vocal. Right, we really need to be able to hear those lyrics, and, and uh, you know. But at the same time, um, in contemporary music, especially, we need to be able to have a time reference. So, a lot of kick, a lot of snare is, is uh, pretty popular. Uh, everybody knows when to clap, and uh, right. But we also need a pitch reference, so some kind of melody instrument that we can use um, to do that. So there are many uh, factors here when, in kind of picking out what the important things are in the mix. Um, and then, can you hear everything? Should you hear everything is, is probably a better question, right? Um, how many of you guys have pastor's wife singing and maybe she's not quite on pitch that week? So you have to, you have to dance that line. But, um, you know, pretty much everybody on stage, you, you want to be able to feature them at some point, right? And um, so uh, whether the acoustic guitar, acoustic guitar comes up for a kind of a solo and then you kind of back it off, you, mean, you don't necessarily have to hear everybody all the time, but when their part is appropriate, right? Well, how do we figure out when it's appropriate? We'll get, that. We'll get there. So uh, what's happening inside of the mix, right? Um, this, these are kind of the, the questions that we should ask ourselves when we start thinking about critical listening, right? Um, learning to hear the subtleties, getting down on stage, trying different mics and positions. Simply put, paying attention to the details. So um, you ever heard what that snare sounds like by itself? Go on stage and listen to it. How is it tuned? Are the drums too old or the heads too old? Do we need to replace the drum heads? Right? Um, what does that guitar amp sound like? What is it, you know, if you, um, not hitting your shins, but if you aim it up at you and actually get, hear what the speaker is doing, what does that sound like, right? What, is, what does the singer sound like? Is she a little nasally today? Is she kind of congested? Um, or is she, is she really bright or is she really full? Um, these are dynamics that are going to change week to week. And um, so it's just important to kind of know what source you have coming in before you just listen to it blindly out of the console. Because um, for a lot of things, like drum tuning, you can do everything that you want on the board, but you're not going to fix the drums if it's, they're tuned improperly, right? Um, so uh, trying different mics, different positions, this is another really important thing. Some people just don't sound good on certain mics. And certain mics, um, especially vocal mics, when you learn about them, uh, feature certain frequencies to help intelligibility and things. But sometimes that doesn't always work with certain singers. So picking different mics for that, different mics for different kinds of guitars, right? These are all really important things and things that you should really nail down and, and put into your input list before we even touch the consoles. Um, so the other thing that we need to consider is what are we mixing, right? What kind of styles are we mixing? I'm not going to mix a smooth jazz concert the same way that I would mix uh, a heavy metal concert, right? This might seem obvious, but um, you know, if all I listen to every day is talk radio, and then I come in and, and make contemporary worship, this, is, this might be a little bit of an issue. We need to be able to learn and, and pay attention to the subtleties of things, of the styles of music that we're mixing, so that we mix appropriate, right? If I love listening to classical music, but I'm mixing contemporary worship, I've got to learn how to um, mix for that style, where the kick, the drums are appropriate for that style. It may not necessarily be my favorite, but it's, it's what sounds right for the room and what sounds right what the worship leader is going for, right? So we've got to really try and capture that vision. 
Um, how many inputs are we using, right? Well, what's, what's our input list look like? If I have an acoustic guitar all by itself, I'm going to EQ that and process that completely differently than if I've got an acoustic guitar with a full band playing at the same time, right? This is why I can't tell you this is the, this is the way that you EQ an acoustic guitar, and this is the way that you EQ um, a electric guitar and a piano. And all. There's no one way because it all depends on what else is going on in the mix, right? Um, so we're going to get a little bit more into that in a second. What kind of console are you using, right? This isn't necessarily what brand, but do you have a digital console? Do you have an analog console? How many EQ bands do you have? What kind of high-pass filter do you have in there? How many aug sends do you have? What are you working with, right? We need to know what our limit is. That way we know how much to expect and how much to push it. But at the end of the day, we can only get so much out of what we have. And there's no point in upgrading if we're not maximizing what we are currently using, right? So a lot of people always want the newest and greatest thing, but if you're not taking full advantage of what you currently have, you're not going to realize the gains of the new thing. So we've got to kind of pay attention to that too. What kind of speakers are we using? Again, this isn't necessarily about brand. This is about the PA. Do I have a subwoofer? If I don't have a subwoofer, there's no way that I'm going to get that kick to melt everybody's face out of a little 10-inch driver. So I'm not even going to try and turn up the low end in that kick, right? I'm going to use what I've got to the best of my ability. And if that means that we're not melting faces, we're not going to melt faces. But we're going to try and use it uh, in the best way we can. And uh, so this brings us to um, the EQ function on our console. And uh, so when we're going and we're, we're ready to start EQing and, and processing our channel, um, there are a couple of controls that kind of, uh, that will kind of come to mind. And, and when we think about um, using EQ, um, the, one of the first things that I really want to convey is that you've only got so much bandwidth to fit everything in, uh, in one space, right? So humans here generally from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, right? It's probably a little bit less than that now that we're getting older, but um, we've only got so much bandwidth to fit everything in. And don't write this chart down, but this chart is a really good example of wh how so many instruments overlap in this same amount of real estate. And um, that doesn't do very good things for intelligibility, right? So what we need to do is actually carve out some holes and, and create space in the mix so that each instrument can be featured when they need to um, and so they're not overlapping each other so much. So um, the way that we'll do this is uh, I like to think of the mix like we talked about as real estate. And maybe if you, if you were to take a picture of a room and kind of cut it out, um, this might be kind of something you see. So imagine that Low frequencies are kind of on the floor, and high frequencies are kind of on the ceiling here. And, um, and as you look at this chart, you'll see. So most of us, we'll start sound check, and we'll say, OK, can I, let's hear the kick drum. So the kick drum starts going. And um, so great, we start EQing that kick drum. It sounds really huge and awesome. Man, it just, you, know, you can just tell if it's going to be a good day by the way that kick drum sounds, right? Oh, man, it's just, the tuning is really good, and it, I mean, it's just really great, and I got you know, a nice low end in there, and it's really punchy, and there's lots of click, and it's awesome. Okay, this kick drum sounds huge. Great. You did, let's hear what the snare sounds like. So the um, drummer starts hitting the snare, and um, again, it, you're EQing it, and it sounds really great. It sounds like a shotgun, right? I mean, awesome. Yeah, we're, we're mounting faces here, and really great. Got it nice and compressed real tight, and you know, whatever. So great. That sounds pretty good. Now let's hear, let's hear the rest of the drum set. So he starts playing the toms, we start doing the overheads, and this is just the most amazing godlike drum set that you've ever heard in your life, right? It's just really working today. So, okay, let's stop. Now let's, uh, let's hear the bass guitar. So the bass guitar starts playing, and um, same thing. It's just a really great day, and you, you EQ it, and you got it all uh, compressed, and it just sounds really awesome by itself. Okay, stop. Let's hear, uh, let's hear the acoustic guitar. So you do the same thing. Let's hear the electric guitar, same thing keyboard, right? You EQ that, and it just sounds really great. And uh, all right, let's hear the vocals. So the vocals start going, and they sound really good. And OK, awesome. Let's uh, we'll play a song, and then we're going to throw up the mix. So they start playing, and you push up all the faders, and it sounds terrible. It sounds really congested and really muddy, and there's no real clear definition. It kind of looks like this picture, right? There's no real, we don't really know exactly what's going on. It's loud. So what do we end up doing, right? The vocals are pretty important. So we end up turning up the vocals even more. And now, OK, great, I can hear the vocals, but now there's a weird space between the vocals and the band, and it, it still doesn't sound quite right. I mean, I guess I hear vocal, but I'm, it's you know, ripping my head off. So what happened? Well, all the instruments sounded really good by themselves, but they're all taking up so much bandwidth that now when they're all together, they're, just, they're fighting for real estate, and there's no space for them to, to kind of 
um, fit freely. So what we want to really do is try and shrink everything down as much as we can and um, make all these instruments smaller so that there's a nice clean line of where everything should be um, in our mix. So using EQ, this is what we'll use to kind of help create some of that space. So um, when we think of EQ, we'll, we think of uh, controls typically like this. We'll have uh, usually some kind of high pass filter. We've got our high um, shelf. We've got uh, our mid-range um, peaking uh, bell curve type EQ. And then we've got a low shelf, right? So the mid-range um, uh, area is what we're going to kind of talk about first. And um, you'll see a lot of consoles will have two knobs there, right? Especially if you're looking at an analog console. And so one of the knobs is for frequency, and the other one is for gain. And uh, so what we can actually do is use uh, our gain knob to boost and cut, and our frequency to pick kind of what specifically, what specific part of that uh, instrument that we need to make adjustments to. So here's a, here's a use case scenario here for you. We've got our, let's say we've got our uh, piano, right? And the piano's playing, and it's great. And um, so we're going to take our EQ here, and we're going to take that gain knob on that, uh, that mid-range EQ, and we're going to boost it while the piano's playing. What that's going to do is it's going to help reveal problems to us, reveal things that are muddy, maybe things that are harsh. And as we sweep around, you're going to hear those different things change. And once we kind of find the right spot that says, ah, you know what, that's pretty muddy, that doesn't sound quite right, then what we can do is cut it. And now we've got a nice space here where other instruments can fill in, um, and there's less competition between them, right? We've just created more bandwidth um, by cutting out some space there, right? And we don't necessarily need things in that frequency anyway because maybe we're going to have another instrument that's going to kind of fill that in, right? So, um, so let, I'm going to jump on the console now. And uh, I'll kind of show you a little bit what I'm talking about, and, and we'll, uh, we'll listen to it at the same time. So um, go ahead, and um, you guys just take your, uh, your headphone knob right here and just turn it all the way down. That way, um, when I play these tracks, they're not coming up. But uh, so I'm just going to play these tracks here. And um, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to bring up our, uh, our kick drum here. Right? So there's our kick. And uh, I'm going to work on the EQ here. So the uh, We'll just kind of do a couple of channels to kind of show you what we're talking about, and, um, and so you kind of hear it. So my goals for the kick drum here, this is kind of a very contemporary worship style, and, um, and uh, so we, we want that kick to be nice and full, sanity, give, give some good punch, um, but we also need to have uh, some good click in it. We want it to be able to kind of cut through a little bit so people can kind of tell the difference between uh, kick and snare. Um, the other thing, too, is that, uh, well, how many, we've got two kick drum mics here. We've got kick in and kick out, right? So, um, and the reason I do this is because, um, you know, you could either, you can use one mic, totally fine, but, you know, a lot of us use two mics, so we'll talk about blending them as well. So the kick in mic, um, this is a uh, 91, and it's a condenser mic, and it's got lots of, lots of high-end good click out of it. It's right next to the head, so we probably won't get as much low end out of it because it's, it is so close to the head um, as much as we would get with the 52 that's just right on the outside. Um, so we're going to kind of keep that in mind, and when we're working with this instrument, we'll know that its, its primary focus is going to be for, for snap and attack, right? So um, as we're working with this, I, wanna, I want you to listen to, as I sweep for the EQ, um, and I listen to this channel, maybe, well, let's just listen to it really quick and see what we think. Right? So, cool, it sounds like a kick drum, great, but I think we can probably do some more to sweeten it up. Maybe, um, maybe let's, we want to hear a little bit more high end, or we want to hear just a little bit more roundness on the bottom. So instead of thinking in a way of, I want to hear more high end, let's turn up the high end. Maybe let's think, what's competing with that? high end, and, and let's kind of scoop that out and, um, and create some space there. So um, listen to what happens when I start playing with this EQ. I'm going to sweep around, and we're going to find kind of a real like mid-rangey, paper-ish kind of muddiness. And listen to what happens when I pull that out and, listen, and, uh, and how the high end kind of responds to that. So um, here we go.
hear how the, the high end is a lot more pronounced? Now that we just kind of pulled out some of those, that low end, it's, the high end is a little clickier. Um, and you know whether I pulled out too much or not is uh, relevant at this point. But um, by pulling out something, that really revealed a lot of what, what else is going on in there. So you'll hear, if I sweep this up, you might hear a little bit more low end in there. And if I sweep it down, you'll hear more high end. So we just completely changed the sound of our kick drum um, by pulling something out. So you see this is our zero line right here. So you see we're cutting out. But maybe if you imagine that this is our zero line, we're totally featuring some nice low in there and some nice clickiness. And, um, and we did that by reducing our, our gain here and, and creating a nice huge hole here for other instruments to fill without as much competition. If we move over to the, uh, the 52 on the outside, You can obviously hear a lot more low end coming out of that. So that's really great. We want that. Um, but still, it's going to be, um, what can we do to kind of feature that low end a little bit more and kind of round it out? So if we listen to this, we'll do a similar process where we'll kind of uh, boost and sweep and, and see what kind of gets a little, get in, in the way a little bit. So here that low end just gets a little rounder, a little more just super low end. So if I blend the two now, So now I'm getting a really huge sound out of both of those mics. And this is with two mics, this is great. If you only have one, you can totally do it in a similar way. Um, you're just going to EQ it and say, all right, well, I don't want to pull out as much high end because I still need the high end in the one mic and, and the low. Um, but we totally just revealed a lot more um, that's going on with that high end in there. And maybe we'll decide, you know what, maybe I do want more click in that one mic because I just really want it to sound like Metallica or something. I can still boost a little bit, but now I don't have to boost as much. Um, and the thing about boosting is that when, you're, when you actually start increasing gain on a channel, you're adding frequencies that weren't there to begin with, right? So um, this is a lot more unnatural sounding than it is to pull this out, right? Um, so, uh, and you're also boosting other things that that mic is picking up as well um, that might be kind of seeping in there. So the next thing I want to talk about is our, um, our overheads. And um, so these are uh, our... Uh, so when you, when you talk about an overhead mic, um, yeah, it doesn't really know what it's listening to or what it's aimed at, right? It just knows a mic and I'm going to pick up everything that I hear, especially a condenser mic. Um, it's pretty agnostic to frequencies. It's a very flat response um, instrument style mic, and um, it's going to pick up everything. So in a way, we almost need to use a little bit of EQ to kind of focus the mic and, and kind of really specify what its job is, right? So if I've got um, these overhead mics, um, I'm going to want to use what's called a high-pass filter. And our high-pass filter um, actually lets high frequencies pass through. You can also think of it as a low cut. It cuts low end. So um, the first thing I'm going to do to this overhead mic is cut out low end, because there's a lot that's bleeding in there that I don't really necessarily want. Whether I want this overhead mic to capture all of the drums or I just want to feature cymbals, I'm still going to want to cut out some low end. So you'll listen to this overhead, and, and let's see what happens when we um, turn on our high-pass filter. Uh, another thing is, is that high-pass filters on, on most analog consoles and digital consoles, the default setting is at 80. No, on analog consoles, you don't really have the option to sweep up or to take away more low end. On a digital console, you do. I'll show you the, the workaround with analog. But, um, so I'm going to start at 80. You probably won't hear a whole lot, maybe a little bit out of the subs. And then we're going to sweep up, and we're going to listen to how much we can actually isolate uh, the sound of that, that, those mics. Oh. 
Sorry, I'm on the wrong channel. That would help. Pretty, pretty remarkable how much that kind of really just cleans up the sound um, of just your overhead mics, right? Most microphones, um, we're going to want to put a high-pass filter on, so let's listen to what it sounds like with, uh, with our snare mic. Helps out a little bit there. Same with um, something like hi hat. So it really kind of helps out, and, and some instruments will be more apparent than others. But when you think if you've got 24, 32, 48 channels, all all live open mics and you've got a little bit of low end like that bleeding in on every channel, that's all going to build up and it's going to sum up. So if you take out that low end on all those channels that it's unnecessary, um, that's really going to clean things up um, for, for a lot of it. And like I was saying, pretty much every instrument um, and every microphone really is going to have uh, this high pass filter on it. Um, the only things that are probably the exception are going to be <clears throat> kick drum and bass guitar. Um, and even then, there are certain, I mean, if you don't have, unless you've got some crazy concert level PA system, your subwoofers probably don't do a very good job of reproducing things down at 20, 25 hertz, maybe up to 30 hertz. Um, so I might still, like, on this kick drum, uh, these subs in this room go really, really low. So I might still put on a high pass filter, but just do a little bit right around, you know, 28 or so, just to kind of get that really whooshy sound out. Um, it also makes your subs a little bit more efficient because it takes a lot of power to, pr to push 20 cycles out. Um, so if you can kind of cut that out, you're not really hearing a lot of it. Um, that might actually help make your system a little more efficient, and especially if you have small subs, make them, uh, make them a little nice and punchier. Um, so like I said, almost every channel. And that's, that's probably the only firm rule of EQ. Like I was saying, I can't tell you how to EQ an acoustic guitar one way. I can't tell you how to do this, but most things use high-pass filters. And um, I would say j just engage that high-pass filter and start sweeping up until you hear it start um, sounding pretty unnatural on whatever the primary instrument is, and you can kind of make the call from there. Um, the other thing is just for you analog folks, really quick, if you're... Uh, um, if you have an analog console and you don't have the ability to sweep up, um, a lot of us have, um, or all EQs, when we have what's called a low shelf, and that's kind of what it looks like. Most of them are around 125, maybe 160, um, start at 160 hertz, and that's kind of what it would look like if you were on your analog console. So if you turn your high pass filter on at 80, and then just take your low shelf and go down, I mean, nothing you're getting a very similar effect and you're cleaning up so much of that low end. So if we were to listen to that on, uh, on our, on our uh, overheads here, we were to get a really similar effect. Right? So, um, this isn't. This is a really great tool to use. Don't be afraid to turn that low knob down, especially because it's you know right around 125 or 150. Um, there's not a whole lot going down in that range. Even with vocals, I would I wouldn't be afraid to turn that down. Um, so if we wanted to, we'll just listen to a vocal really quick and um, and see how we can kind of clean that up. And uh, let me take off my fake EQ from before. Um, so here's our vocal. Of course, he's not singing. Let me do this. Start the verse. Come on, let's turn it up. We're gonna sing it out for all the world to hear. Oh, 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 oh. There's love for everyone. A new day has begun. Something to shout about. Let it be known that our God saved, our God reigns. We lift you up. So 
so that'll really help that too, just really kind of clean them up. Now, since we're on the vocal, we'll talk a little bit more about going to EQing the, using the EQ um, on the console. Um, when, and you'll learn this in, in basic mic theory, but the closer that you get to a mic, um, you have an effect, what's called the, the proximity effect. And this is um, any, any unidirectional mic, when you, the closer that you get to it, you actually get low end buildup. And, um, and it's kind of a natural hap thing that happens physically with the mic and the, and your, uh, the instrument. Um, so when you're really close to a mic, you're actually getting a lot more low end um, than, than is what is natural. So when we, just keeping that in mind on a, on a vocal mic, um, we may end up needing to compensate for that at some point if it, if it sounds a little muddy. So what I want to do is um, we'll kind of show you just with that in mind and thinking about that. The other thing is I know that um, this particular time we're using three um, vocals here. So we've got, um, we listening to this song, most, two of the guys are they're kind of singing unison most of the time and one of the guys is singing harmony. Well, if we've got two guys singing, singing unison, that means they're singing the same thing. So we really got to make sure that we create space for both of them because they're singing the same thing. So, um, so we'll kind of listen to what the sounds like here when we start playing with this vocal. So I'm gonna turn it up and start using the EQ here. We shouted name now, shouted louder. We shouted out loud, sing, let it be the call. Typical. We lift you up, up, let it be the. We lift you up. up So it got a little muddy there down in, in that particular frequency. So that's where I know where it's a little sensitive, especially with that mic and his voice and the way it is. So I'm going to pull a little bit of that out. And um, depending on, again, how many other vocals I have in there, maybe almost to a fault where it, maybe it's borderline thin um, because there's so much other else going on in there, we really need to create some space. So let's listen to what it sounds like when we thin it out a little bit and, and pull some of that muddiness out. Is there a jam in here? Come on, let's turn it up. We're gonna sing it out for all the world to hear. Oh, 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 oh. There's love for everyone. A new day has begun. Something to shout about. Let it be known that our God saved, our God reigns. We lift you up. Let it be known the love has come. Love. Right. And that really can kind of help clean up the vocal. Now, again, maybe it's slightly too thin, but there's so much else going on. Our main concern is that we want to get that vocal out and above the mix. Um, so we can be kind of careful with this, and maybe we decide that we want to pull a little bit more back in once we get everything else in there. Um, but understanding the kind of real estate process, we're going to want to make sure that we, we get enough out. The other thing to consider, too, here is when we're looking at our EQ, this is, this is kind of universal for all EQ, we've got... Um, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, essentially 20,000 frequencies um, that we have to, to fill in um, this real estate, right? Um, so, but it's pretty interesting that when we're looking at this console, and, and again, this is universal for all EQ, we've got probably 55, 60% of the EQ here is going from 20 hertz to 1,000 hertz. So 60% of our focus is zoomed in on only 1,000 hertz. That's one, essentially 1 20th of our bandwidth. The other 40% of our EQ is focusing on the other 19,000 frequencies. That's really interesting, right? Why are we so focused on this low mid area? Well, this low mid area is where all of our fundamental notes come out in our, on our sounds, all our vowel sounds, right? Things that come from our gut, A, E, I, O, A, U, right? These kinds of frequencies and sounds. Um, so these are what's called the fundamentals, and this is where a lot of the body of that instrument comes. Mostly up here is where all of the um, transients and consonants uh, sounds, right, from vocals come from K's, T's, S's. They're all up here. There's a lot more real estate up here for all of this to fit in than there is down here. So we're really focused in here um, to really make sure that we can kind of clean this up. And um, it also just happens to be that these are set up in octaves, right? So the octave of 20 hertz is 40 hertz, and the octave of that is 80 hertz, and the octave of that is 160, and it kind of goes on. So the octave of 1K is 2K, and from 2K to 4K and 4K. So it kind of gradually builds as we go on. So it naturally allows us to kind of zoom in here and, and focus. So when we think about you know, 10, 15 instruments on stage that all have fundamentals, um, 
we have a lot less real estate for all these instruments to share down here in the fundamental, which is where usually things like muddiness are interpreted, than we do up here in, in the high end. So um, not to say that to not focus up in the high end, but um, pulling, you might look at this EQ and say, wow, he's pulling a lot out of his voice. Well, I'm really only pulling from 500 down. I'm only changing it. That leaves 99% of his vocal you know, pretty untouched, right? So, um, so don't be discouraged if you look at the, the EQ on here. Some of the best things that digital consoles ever did to us, for us, was enable us to see the EQ, and now we can kind of see what we're doing, and it makes a lot more sense. But one of the worst things that digital consoles ever did for us was enabled us to look at the EQ, because we might do something crazy and, and think that that looks wrong, um, but we're not listening to what it sounds like. So don't be afraid to turn the knobs all the way and, and, and really get a good sound. Um, the other really important thing, too, that I want to discuss with EQ is the Q. Um, that's basically the bandwidth, right? So I can make our bandwidth really narrow or really wide if I wanted to. Um, by default, most consoles have their bandwidth nice and wide like this. This is a very musical sounding EQ, and um, it might look like you're affecting a lot of frequencies, but it's actually um, it's a very, very analog um, mindset of doing it. The reason that we would want to be able to narrow um, our bandwidth here is um, primarily for feedback reduction, right? So if I got something in this mic that's ringing, maybe I can kind of boost this, and I'm only finding one, just a couple of problem frequencies right in this area, and I can cut this out, but the intent is that I can cut it out without changing the tonality of the instrument so much. So it's a little bit different use. Now we can still make adjustments and do a little bit wider, a little bit narrower if necessary, right? Maybe if you're, um, you know, if, if you're using a kick drum, you only want to boost a little bit, so you might do that, or maybe you want it to be a little bit wider. Um, but in general, um, I, I just have a lot of people that have come up and say, oh, digital consoles, um, you know, they, they sound different than analog or whatever. And, and if you look at any famous analog console that you've thought of, uh, any Neve or API or whatever, and you look at their, uh, their, um, their bandwidth on their EQ, they're super, super, super wide, usually, you know, two octaves wide sometimes. And, um, so, uh, you know, I would just encourage everybody, leave it at the default setting if you can, and don't, be, don't get discouraged when you see something crazy like this and think that you're, you're just killing the channel. I mean, listen to what it, it's really doing and try and leave it as natural and analog sounding as possible. Um, so, uh, because if we, you know, if we start doing things like this, you're not gonna, you're actually gonna feel like you need to cut out more in order to get the kind of the same desired effect rather than just widening it out and, and leaving it really natural. Um, so, uh, so we're just going to keep that in mind too. You won't see me playing with the cue a whole lot for that reason. Um, but if we go back to uh, to mixing here, um, here's another instrument that we've got here: the rhythm guitar. Now, this instrument takes up a lot of bandwidth, right? And especially depending on its role, um, we might want to be very prominent in the mix, or we're just going to have it take a back seat because the keys are leading, right? So in this song. Um, it's very synth driven. The synth is really kind of a, a predominant thing, but synth is not a very, um, it doesn't take up a lot of bandwidth. Let's listen to it. There's not a whole lot of um, really fundamental in there. I mean, there's some, but so the guitar is actually going to really kind of help um, keep some of the body and the warmth of this mix going. Um, but we've also got a, a lead guitar too, so let's listen to what these two sound like here. Of course, they're not playing. Let me start over here. All right, so two guitars there. Some typical things that um, guitars will have um, issues with is maybe muddiness, depending, especially if you're miking up a, uh, the cabinet. Again, proximity effect. The closer that you get, the more low-end buildup that you're going to have. So definitely want to move that mic around and, and try and get the, the best sound that you can out of it. Um, but there still might be a little bit of low-end buildup. They're also, um, sometimes it can get a little harsh, a little shrill sounding. And if you're going to feature a guitar in the mix um, quite a bit, like a lot of contemporary worship is, um, you're going to want to make sure that that guitar sound doesn't sound too harsh. And a lot of times when people complain about volume, it may not necessarily be that the SPL level is so loud, but that they just don't have a better word for saying, it's hurting my ears, or there's something annoying, right? So if you look at um, human ear sensitivity and, and how sensitive we are to hearing, we're a lot more sensitive to higher frequencies than lower frequencies. Um, it's just the, kind of the natural way that, uh, that we were made. 
So um, when we, let's, I'm just going to take this rhythm guitar and we're going to start boosting and sweeping and you're going to hear when it, gets, when it gets a little harsh and it's kind of like, all right, that's the point. That's where we know that this particular point with this mic, this guitar, that amp sound, whatever, that's where, it, you know, this PA, that's where it's going to get a little harsh. So um, we can remember that and we can actually, if we need to, pull a little bit out so that um, we can feature this guitar more and it, and it won't be killing us. The other thing too is that guitars are really great at producing warm, mid-rangey frequencies, um, but they, they're not really designed to come up really here in the nice sparkly things like synth is or you know cymbals or like the, tss, 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 the sounds of our voice. Um, so it's okay if we kind of make them sound a little darker or, or not as um, tinny. Uh, so let's listen to what this kind of sounds like here. All right, so there were two different things that I heard in there. One was right around this low mid area where it got a little muddy, and then one right around here, we all heard it, that got a little shh, just kind of really harsh. So um, what I'm going to do, like I do with most of the mics, we're going to turn on our high-pass filter and, and make sure that we're cutting out some low end. And then maybe I'm going to pull out that uh, some of that mid-range just a little, or that the low mid area, just to kind of um, take out some of the mud. And um, so we'll go here to the next chorus. And then I might pull out just some high end, just so maybe it's I can I can really afford to crank it up without hurting everybody's ears. So okay, so here's our sound, and and you know you guys hear it probably a little bit different than I do out there. But when I turn it up, listen to what happens when I take out this high end, and it's going to sound like it's a lot more in your face than than it is. And uh, we'll go back to the chorus here. Just a little bit can really just kind of help smooth that out and, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when, as soon as I kind of kicked that in, it was, oh, there it is. Um, so, so that's for rhythm. So that's going to be really prominent in the mix. Now a lead guitar, I might do something completely different or might do the same thing, again, depending on the tone. But um, if we go back to our chorus here. So I might leave that high end in there a little bit just because he's playing such dent, 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 that I want to keep that up in the mix so it kind of cuts through. I may even decide just to kind of give it a little bit of an edge there because that guitar is not super prominent in the mix, just constantly going da na na. It's very, it's got a lot of space in it, dent, 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 dent. So it's not really um, in a position that's in a really going to over exhaust our ears really quick because it's so sporadic, you know, dint, dint, dint. So I can afford to kind of leave that in there a little bit, but I'm still pulling out some low end and, and kind of taking away some of that, that muddiness just to kind of give it a little more clarity. That way I don't have to boost as much. Um, you know, again, if we think of this as our, our zero point, we're featuring a lot of high end in here and, and pulling out some low end. Um, so if we had a piano going on in there as well, we don't on this song, but a piano might, uh, might be another one where, um, depending on what it's playing, if, it's, if, it's, if it is taking the, the spot of that rhythm guitar, I might do a similar thing to it where I pull out some of that, a little bit of um, the, the low mid-range where it gets a little muddy, um, but I'll leave, I'll leave kind of the fundamental a little bit alone because it's kind of carrying some of that melody. If it's not, if the guitar is supposed to carry the melody and the piano's kind of playing around it, I might cut out a lot more of that mid-range to give it space because I don't need that piano in that same range that that guitar is in. So I'm just going to make it, the piano a little sparkly and, and kind of cut out some of that mid-range so that you can, you pretty much just hear the right hand of that piano essentially. Um, especially because if the piano player is playing with their left hand, that's going to start getting into the lower end of the guitar and the bass a little bit. And we've got plenty of bass here. 
And um, so we don't necessarily need any of the guitars to go that low. We don't need the piano to go that low. We don't necessarily need synth to go that low, unless it's part of the sound and part of the effect, right? So that's kind of keeping in mind the goal of the entire song. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and then loops, um, you know, this will be a this will be kind of a different thing depending on how you guys make your loops. Some people will do loops for the entire band. That way, if the guitar player doesn't come, they're in there. Well, we will EQ EQ accordingly. Maybe we need to take out some of that mid range where the guitar is, or or we'll leave it in because we don't have a guitar player this service. Or um, so that's a little bit more. But again, approaching it from that same mindset of what am I doing? What what all is happening in the mix? Um, what do I need to do to kind of clean it out? So again, um, as I'm going to come up here to the front, um, you know, paying attention to the details in the mix and kind of really thinking, how is this supposed to sound? Um, listening to the track ahead of time. Um, you know, let's say you're doing, you know, uh, United from the New Zion album, and you're and you're working on, okay, what does that what does that kick drum sound like? What does that snare sound like? Where is it in the mix? Um, is it really pronounced or is it back a little bit? You know, where are the, where are the, background, the background vocals at? You know, are they really featured or are they just kind of really so? Can you only hear them in the, in the chorus but not in the verse, right? So what all does that sound like? I was, um, it's really interesting. I was talking to um, a, a buddy of mine. He uh, used to mix for Michael Jackson and uh, he was his monitor engineer and, and he was telling me a story of what one day he was um, in his car with his wife and they were driving somewhere and a song comes on the radio and and uh, his wife really liked the song. She's singing along, and, and uh, she noticed that he wasn't singing. And so he's like, what? you know what? Do you not know the words of the song? And he's like, no, actually, I don't, I don't know the, the lyrics. And you've been mixing for this guy for how many years, and you don't know the, the lyrics to the songs? And, and it was, his response was really revealing to him. He just remembered thinking, I could tell you everything about this song, where the guitar solo is, how much compression is on his vocal, when he does his oohs and ahs and whatever. But I, don't, I just don't listen to the lyrical content because I, that's not what I'm listening to. I'm listening to the mix in, in a whole. And I know exactly when to push up that fader for the solo. And, I, and, and that was kind of pretty impressive to me, too. And, and you know, not that we shouldn't know the lyrics to the songs, but um, you know, paying attention to the details, to that, to that amount of um, you know, zooming in and really focusing on that is, is really what makes an engineer a, a quality engineer. You know? And um, you know, knowing the melody and knowing when this drum fill is going to happen and when the little the bass does his walk down um, into the verse and and all of these little things to know when to feature him in the mix and how to you know EQ that. So um, I just really really encourage you guys as you're going and you're driving to church on Sunday morning or whatever during the week, you know the songs that are, you're going to play. Be mindful of that and be listening to them. You know, I mean, you can listen to your talk radio and whatever else, but you know work on getting muscle memory, you know, of that mix and what it's supposed to sound like. And, and you know, you, uh, just, you'll, be, it'll, you'll be really amazed at um, how much you, what, how you start listening to music from now on. And, and uh, you might even find that you'll appreciate newer styles, you know, or, or different styles of music based on the mix and how the production is, not necessarily how terrible the auto-tune is on someone's voice, right? Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave these tracks playing for a little bit. I want you guys to kind of practice using the EQ and um, just practice cutting things out and trying to create space for things to kind of, you know, harmonize together and, and, and live together without too much competition. And I'll come around and, and uh, be able to ask, answer any questions you have. So, so thanks. We'll take a quick break and uh, do this, and uh, we'll come back a little bit later.